In this section, we'll cover the history of computer networking. Now, our course is about principles and practice, and in this history overview, you'll see that some of the principles and practices are relatively new, but others have their foundations in research that was done 60 years ago, 30 years before the birth of the internet, and if you're a college-age student now, even more than 30 years before your birth. And some networking ideas are even older, the telephone network, for example, is more than 100 years old. They had to deal with issues like switching and routing. Here's a picture of the first switch that was installed in the Paris Central Office for their telephone network in 1879. And here's an even older picture of another network, a semaphore signaling network. This is a semaphore relay node that was used to relay encrypted, end-to-end -end encrypted messages from source to destination. Both the switch and this uh, example of the semaphore node are in an amazing museum called the Arts and Métiers Museum in Paris. So if you make it to Paris, forget the Louvre, forget the Musée d'Orsay, go to the Arts and Métiers Museum, especially if you like networking. But let's get back to the history of computer networking. And there are a lot of great resources online, documentaries, websites, books that people have written, and our coverage here is gonna be pretty quick. And what we want to do is we're going to break the history of computer networking into five epochs. So why don't we get started in 1961 and look at the early days of packet switching. Let's start in 1961. The telephone network at the time was the world's dominant communication network. Now, remember that the telephone network uses circuit switching, which we looked at earlier, to transmit information from sender to receiver. And this was probably an appropriate choice given that voice is generated and transmitted at a constant rate. But given the increasing importance of computers, including time-shared computers, the 1960s was probably natural to consider how should we hook computers together so that they could be shared among geographically distributed users. The traffic generated by such computer users was likely to be bursty, with periods of activity followed by period of inactivity. Well, the first paper published on packet switching was by Len Kleinrock, who was a graduate student at MIT, he's a professor at UCLA still. He used queuing theory to show the effectiveness of packet switch networks for handling bursty traffic. By 1964, Paul Barron at the Rand Institute had begun investigating the use of packet switching in military networks, and at the National Physical Laboratory in England, researchers were also developing their ideas on packet switching. It's pretty amazing that these three research groups around the world, each unaware of each other's work at the time, were to become the inventors of packet switching. There must have been something in the air at the time. In 1967, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, also known as ARPA, published a plan for a network known as ARPANET, which would become the world's first packet switch computer network and the oldest direct ancestor of what we know today of as the internet. In 1972, the first host-to-host -host protocol, known as the Network Control Protocol, NCP, was completed. It's the direct ancestor of TCP and IP. Ray Tomlinson wrote the first email program, and the ARPANET had already grown to 15 nodes. The initial ARPANET was just a single standalone network, and in the early to mid-1970s, several other standalone packet-switched networks were coming into existence. AlohaNet was a microwave network linking universities on the Hawaiian Islands together. DARPA was building a second packet switch network, a packet satellite network, as well as a packet radio network. That's essentially the ancestor of today's cellular data networks. Cyclades was a French packet switching network. The number of networks was growing. And with perfect hindsight, you can look back and see that the time was ripe for developing some kind of all-encompassing architecture for connecting networks together. The first work on interconnecting networks together was again undertaken by DARPA. Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn published a paper in 1974 laying out the principles of what they called internetting, how to build a network of networks. Their internetting principles that we'll come to understand really deeply in this course have essentially defined today's internet architecture. You can see the four points here. Minimalism and autonomy, the ability to easily interconnect networks with no internal changes. The notion of a best effort service model, knowing that packets could be lost 
or delayed within the network. What's known as stateless routing and an overall decentralized approach towards how networks should be controlled. In 1976, Ethernet was invented by Bob Metcalf in his PhD thesis, and there were proprietary commercial networks being built. At the end of the decade, ARPANET has 200 nodes. The 1980s were marked by the standardization of a suite of ARPANET protocols that we're still using today, and in the continued explosive growth in networks. In the ARPANET community, many of the final pieces that form the foundation of today's internet architecture were falling into place. TCP and IP were standardized in the early 1980s. The SMTP email protocol was developed in 1982, and SMTP is still the defining protocol for email. The domain name system, which is used to map between a human-readable internet name, for example, gaia.cs.umass.edu, and a 32-bit IP address was developed. That was 1983. SMTP and DNS, the domain name system, are application layer protocols, and so we'll study them in a lot of detail when we get to the next chapter. In the late 1980s, important extensions were made to TCP to implement host-based congestion control, that is to allow a host to decrease its sending rate when it notices packet loss or packet delay due to congestion. In the 1980s, there were also a number of new computer networks that were created to link universities together. There was a network called BitNet that provided email and file transfers among universities in the Northeast. There was a network called CSNet, the Computer Science Network, that was formed to link university researchers who didn't have access to ARPANET, which was still running. And in 1986, the National Science Foundation created NSFNet to provide access to NSF-sponsored supercomputing centers. And by the end of the decade, the role of NSF expanded, and it was now serving as a primary backbone, linking regional networks and interconnecting with other networks. And by the end of the 1980s, the number of hosts that were connected to this network of networks, something looking a lot like today's internet, would reach 100,000 hosts. So now we're at the 1990s. The early 1990s saw a number of events that symbolized the continued evolution of the network and the soon to arrive commercialization of the internet. ARPANET, the progenitor of the internet that we looked at earlier, was decommissioned. In 1991, NSFNet lifted its restrictions on the use of NSF for commercial purposes. I can still remember the day when I received my first email advertisement. Up until then, the acceptable use policy for these networks was that they were not to be used for commercial purposes. No advertising. Can you imagine? NSFNet was decommissioned in 1995, and new businesses Internet service providers, like the tier one providers we discussed earlier, sprung up to carry backbone traffic. And of course, the main event for the 1990s from a networking point of view was the birth of the World Wide Web. The web was invented at CERN by Tim Berners-Lee in the early 1990s, based on ideas that originated in earlier work on hypertext back in the 1940s. Berners-Lee and his colleagues developed initial versions of HTML, that's the markup language for writing web documents, HTTP, the application layer protocol from the, for the web that we'll study earlier, a web server and a browser, the four key components of the web. In the late 1990s, the use of the web exploded. Network security became a critical issue and there were somewhere around 50 million hosts on the internet. So in the 10 years between 1989 and 1999, the number of hosts grew from 100,000 to 50 million, and backbone speeds changed from a few megabits per second to gigabits per second. And so what have we seen from 2000, 2005 until the present? Well, we've seen the aggressive deployment of broadband into the home, running at tens to hundreds of megabits per second. In 2008, software-defined networking was defined. We're gonna take a very close look at that when we get to chapter five. We've seen the increasing ubiquity of high-speed wireless access, first Wi-Fi and increasingly 4G and soon 5G networks. We've also seen service providers, content providers like Google, Facebook, and Microsoft creating their own global backbone networks, bypassing the commercial internet tier one ISPs to connect close to the end users. This is so that they can provide close to instantaneous access to social media, search, search, 
video content. And then we've seen enterprises running their services in the cloud through Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure. We'll look at data center networks, for example, when we get to chapter five. And lastly, we've seen the rise of smartphones and an, and an increased emphasis on mobility. Since 2017, there are actually more mobile devices than fixed devices connected to the internet. In this section, we've gone through a brief overview of the history of computer networking, but hopefully you've already seen the emergence of some of the ideas that we'll be studying in this course. And with this section, we conclude the broader overview of all of computer networking. Well, in this broad overview of computer networking, we've covered a ton of material. Remember, we started by asking the basic questions, what's the internet and what's a protocol? Then we started at the network edge. We talked about the devices, the hosts, the servers at the network edge. We talked about access networks and we dove down deep into the core. And we talked about the techniques of packet switching and circuit switching. And we talked about the structure of the internet as a network of networks. Then we moved on to network performance. We talked about the issues of packet loss, packet delay, and throughput. We then took a more abstract view of things and we talked about architecture. We talked about layered architecture, the notion of encapsulation of data as uh, protocol data units flow up and down the protocol stack. We then talked about networks under attack and wrapped up our discussion with a quick overview of the history of networking. And so here we are. I hope you found this broad introduction interesting and hopefully not too overwhelming. Remember, the idea here was to get the big picture view, to learn the vocabulary, to see the forest from the trees. I can promise you that in the upcoming chapters and the upcoming classes, we're gonna dive down into these topics in a lot more detail, it's a lot more to learn, a lot more fun to have.